Welcome into Inside Carolina's Next Level, where, where Greg Barnes and myself get together, talk about things a little bit deeper than your normal game reports and all that. We're joined by a special guest, defensive coordinator for North Carolina, Jeff Collins. How you doing, Coach Collins? Doing great. Appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, Greg and I wanted to get you on, obviously one of the newer members of the staff for Mac Brown, and sort of discuss what makes Jeff Collins – um, and, and how Jeff Collins will affect this North Carolina team down the road. Um, I got a first question for you. Okay. And, and it's going – we'll have softballs, but we'll have tough ones. This is somewhere in the middle. Okay. At what point did you become Jeff Collins that we see today? Um, you know, I'd like to say at birth, but <laughs> um, I, I don't know. Just, uh, you know, I had a um, – love of college football all my life. And, uh, you know, when I graduated from high school, graduated from college, kind of knew that's, I wanted to make that life's work. And I've been blessed with a wonderful wife that has, you know, afforded me the opportunity and support to be able to have my career go in the way it's gone. And, uh, but I think it's just the, the, whatever people see or think or whatever. Um, I think it's just it comes from a genuine place of, you know, just trying to pour into young people and, you know, positively affect them and uh, love the game and just love being around it. Is there anything better than being on the practice field with those guys? Because we've gotten to watch you and sure. you are quite enthusiastic. Yep. Yeah, just, I, I love it. Um, you know, Coach Brown said a couple of times that, you know, it looks like I'm having the best day of my life every day that I'm out there at practice. And, uh, it, you know, games are awesome. Um, but in the meeting rooms, out at practice, you know, when you can really affect, you know, young men's lives and the shape their careers and um, them as people, you know, that that means a lot to me, too. Coach, one of the things that interests me about about offensive and defensive football is kind of the give and take over the years. Uh, and one side's always trying to one up the other. And there seems to be kind of a, a rhythmic uh, motion to that you know one one side has the advantage for a stretch and then the other side catches up sure. and it, uh, you when you so first what, started what stretch are we in right now you think I don't know I, we're gonna get there I'm gonna ask you that is that question um <laughs> really when you got started kind of in the you know the mid 90s it was right on the the forefront I guess of when Rich Rodriguez started doing the sure the spread offense and those types of things. So you, you've kind of seen a lot of the shift to the, to the spread. And right. you know, it wasn't that long ago that the spread was just one thing. Um, and it's kind of everything now. Um, so I'm curious in the, the origin of your philosophy, um, sure. kind of where you got to the mindset of, Hey, we're going to attack. We're going to be aggressive. We're going to do multiple, uh, multiple looks to try to slow down these offenses. Sure. Where did you get started and kind of what was your little pathway in, in terms of becoming the elite defensive coordinator you were when you were at Mississippi State in Florida? Yeah, well, I, first of all, I appreciate that. Um, I, I think it started at Albright College. Um, I was a Division three defensive coordinator. I think I was 26 years old. Uh, me and Matt Rule, he was my linebackers coach. I was the defense coordinator. We thought we had all the answers. And uh, we were out there just dialing up some stuff and uh, having a blast with it. Um, so I was two years as a Division three defense coordinator. And I would say probably 30 to 40 percent of the teams in that league were running the wing tee. So it started off as a defense coordinator, young guy defending the wing tee. Then I go to Georgia Tech with George O'Leary and learn elite defensive schematics from him. So I had a couple of years off being a GA and a tight ends coach. Then I go to Western Carolina University to be the defense coordinator again. Matt Rule is my linebackers coach. And for the next four years, we just shaped our coaching philosophies, uh, <clears throat> working together. Uh, he eventually moved on to be an offensive line coach and started as an offensive coach. But his, his start of his career was with me as a defensive guy. Um, and that league that we were in was the old Southern Conference, and it was a bunch of triple options. So the interesting piece, even though people are spread and they're multiple and RPOs and all those kind of things, everything defensively, in my opinion, starts with defending the triple option. Dive quarterback and pitch, and in all variances, 
that's what the spread offenses are doing. You watch, you know, Lincoln Riley, they do a great job with the nakeds and the boots and all those kind of things. But the way they do it is still an extension of dive quarterback pitch. So everything that we do is gap sound. Uh, every defense that we put in covers every single phase of an offense. And we just try to be as multiple as we can to, to, to give people headaches. Um, then after that, I got I was blessed to go work with Coach Saban uh, her, his first year at the University of Alabama and got ingrained in that coaching philosophy and schematics, Rip Liz match, um, you know, cut and cone and all those kind of things um, that he's become, you know, a legend for. And uh, then it just kind of all of those experiences kind of grew to when I got the experience, the, the chance to be the defense coordinator at FIU, um, took the worst defense in college football and turned it into one of the best. And uh, then I got four years with Dan Mullen at Mississippi State. And then, you know, two years back to back SEC East champions with Jim McElwain at Florida. So all of those experiences at the Division three level, the FCS level prepared me. So when it was my time to be on the biggest and brightest of stages, you know, I, I, I was ready. And, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm just excited to be here with Matt Brown and um, rocking the Carolina blue. We've had a unique scenario where we've actually covered uh, Gene Chizik twice as defensive coordinator at North Carolina. Sure. And when he came back the first time and worked for – or came the first time and worked for Larry Fedora back in 2015 and 16, he talked a lot about the, the change and how the game offensively had shifted since he was with Mac at Texas back in, sure. in 05. And then again, when you know when we returned a couple years ago, he kind of said the same thing that even though he'd been on the sidelines watching as an analyst, there were still a lot of changes that had taken place. So, um, over your coaching career over the last few 25, 30 years, has there been a significant change in terms of offensive football? And um, how have you seen that develop? And and what's the challenges that have kind of uh, caused you issues over the years? Sure. And kind of where are things now in terms of where you think you, you are defensively in the mindset against the offenses of today? Yeah, well, well first of all, let me just say that uh, I've got the utmost respect for Gene Chizik, as I'm sure you guys do as well. Um, the thing that I've been most impressed with um, in coming here as the defense coordinator is how much ball these guys know. And, and that's a credit to Coach Chizik. Like, they know uh, what they're doing. They understand – uh, the philosophies and how to play the schematics of defense. Um, and they understand offenses as well. And that that's, a, I think that's a huge testament to him and his contribution uh, to this great place. Um, interestingly, the, the year that I took off was absolutely amazing for me because I got to study um, from a uh, non-emotional uh, kind of a outsider looking in, um, I did a bunch of consulting work, even consulted with some media uh, gurus and just watch ball with them from a uh, perspective that was was great for me. And just to see all the motions, all the shifts that are starting to, you know, come about all the misdirection, all the unbalance and uh, be able to sit there and formulate some plans so that when I'm back in this chair, I'm ready um, was, was really good for me. But I think the biggest thing over the last couple of years is the multitude of formations, motion shifts, um, constant eye candy um, before almost every snap that you see nowadays. And it just goes back to being sound with your gaps, sound with your assignments, uh, sound with your fundamentals of how you're going to play the game. And, you know, that'll carry over to having success defensively. When you're looking all the, at all the tape and, and analyzing it all, who do, you, who do you turn to to pick their brain? Uh, there, there's there, there's a lot of guys. Um, I was texting with Dan Quinn, the the head coach for the uh, Washington Commanders last night. Um, you know, he's somebody that I've um, gained a lot of respect for. So when I became the defense coordinator at Florida, he had been there, I think, two years prior, and then he went and took over at the Legion of Boom uh, with the Seattle Seahawks. And we kind of became friendly, and I had such a admiration and affection for Pete Carroll and what he had always done defensively and being able to get that um, knowledge firsthand from coach Quinn and just our relationship has remained, um, you know, good and been able to bounce ideas 
off of him. But there, there's so many guys. I don't want to um, name too many and then leave somebody out that's one of my dudes and, you know, they get in their feelings. But um, I, I'm blessed to have great relationships with a lot of great coaches and, uh, you know, the sharing of ideas and knowledge. Um, you know, we do that all the time. When you look back on your career to this point, you, you mentioned the defensive coordinator positions, but you were head coach there yeah. at Georgia Tech. What is the difference and the, and the, I guess, toughness of being a guy that likes to have hands on sure. for being a head coach and sort of managing a team and a roster and all those stuff that comes with it versus being a DC and actually being able to coach? Right. Uh, well, twofold. So, when I was the head coach at Temple University, um, was able to take over for my dear friend, Matt Rule, and we had tremendous success. I think I'm the winningest head coach in the first two years at Temple University, and we had it We had it rolling. It was a great culture. We had great players. And I was able to be a head coach, but also be in the defensive meeting room with the coaches every day. The defensive unit meeting was an integral part of the defensive staff while still being able to be a very successful head coach. The first year at the last place was pretty much the same. I was in the defensive meetings, and then the next year, COVID hits, and combining that with all the things that had to be, um, you know, adjusted and things you, we were doing as a head coach to modernize the program, um, my attention got away from the defense and, um, you know, became a lot about protocols and all of those kind of things that went with the times that we were living in. Um but I'd say that you can do it. Um, the first three years I was a head coach, I was able to do it. And, uh, you know, I had to move away the next couple of years to um, handle big picture um, things. And there's been a lot of things, too, in my year off that I've gone back and really self-reflected on what I could have done better, um, how I would have handled things different, knowing what we know now. Um, but the best thing about that for me is, I'm getting a master class every day from Mac Brown in how to be a head coach. Just watching him on staff meetings, watching him on team meetings, even how he does our seven on seven camps or high school camps, the speeches that he gives before and after um, official visits. It, it has just been such a blessing for me. Um, and early in my career, I noticed my trend was I was a defense coordinator. Then I would do something else for the next couple of years, whether it be a GA or a position coach, be a defense coordinator again, go back to being a recruiting coordinator, position coach again, then a defensive coordinator. And then now I've gone from the defense coordinator to now being a head coach at two different places. Now I get to step back and watch a Hall of Famer every single day do what God made him to do. And uh, it, it's just been such a blessing for me and, you know, such a growth opportunity um, you know, to be involved in this program and to see him um, navigate and manage uh, this entire new landscape of college football with poise, with class, uh, with true love of his players. And uh, that's something that's very important to me. And to see him being able to do it and his win as many games as he has won and continue to do it with such energy and uh, spirit and all those kind of things is just it's it's a, it's a blessing I get to be in this this spot, Coach. Some of our younger yeah. viewers uh, may only know you really from from your head coaching experience. Sure. So that they they may not know the the immense amount of success you had in the SEC as a defensive coordinator, where you earned the nickname the Minister of Mayhem. Um, knew that was right. So <laughs> for our, for our viewers here. What's the basis of that? Um, sure. Not necessarily the, the nickname, but yeah. but your philosophy in terms of, of being yeah. aggressive, creating chaos, those types of things. Well, the, the first thing, and this is what Coach Quinn and I were talking about, about last night, is everything is about getting off the field and creating turnovers defensively. You want to get the ball back for your offense as fast as you can. Three and out or one and out, creating turnovers, um, or getting a three and out. The best way to do that is by putting teams in third and long. And to put teams in third and long, you've got to be aggressive. It doesn't mean you have to be uh, just wild and crazy, but calculated, uh, planned out attacks on protections or in the run game to get them in second and 12, to get them to third and 14, 
to get them off schedule so that then they've got to throw for the first. And then when you do that, tips and overthrows and sacks and cause fumbles, those are the times that those things happen. So our whole objective, even when we're playing base defense, is to create tackles for loss, um, create sacks, create mayhem, and then that leads to turnovers. And I think it's well documented in the hit, the annals of football that if you create more turnovers than the opponent, you probably have a higher likelihood of winning the game. Um, so the whole mayhem rate, I think the last four years I was the D.C. and the SEC, we led the country in uh, havoc rate, mayhem rate. And, uh, you know, that's something we're trying to, you know, instill in these guys uh, since we've been here in January uh, to understand that concept to just create tackles for loss, to get sacks, get offenses off schedule, and then the turnovers will come. Yeah, and to share some some numbers, and these may not be up to date with what you have, but this is kind of what I've just found. Um, to to back that up, when you look at plays that are or drives that have no negative plays, uh, offense scores fifty two percent of the time, and yeah. when you look at drives that have a sack, that number drops to sixteen percent percent of the time that offenses are scoring. Um, Jay Bateman was very big on that type of um, sure. statistics to kind of figure out like, hey, because you know, when Butch Davis was here, you know, not quite 20 years ago, um, at that point they were just saying, okay, well, don't look so much at the total defensive yards. Start looking right. at yards per play. Um, and it's just funny how in a very short time we, we've advanced so much, and now we're saying, okay, well, look, if you have a negative play, that increases your opportunity to get off the field uh, you know, two and three fold. Right. So in terms of your approach, uh, kind of what are some numbers that you're most, um, most important to you? I know you've mentioned turnovers, those types of things. Is there like a, a percentage of, of getting off the field on third down that you're looking for? Any, any, any bullet points like that that you preach to the guys? So creating turnovers, getting sacks, creating tackles for loss are uh, hyped up to the nth degree out at practice and in games in our defensive meeting rooms. But I've also been uh, brainwashed by Coach Saban in the process. And every play has a life of its own. you got to stay in the moment, uh, get the huddle call, uh, know what your assignment, see what the offense is doing, attacking, doing your job, then put that play to bed and play the next play. So I don't really look at those things, but you just know that when you're playing great defense, you're getting turnovers. You're creating three and outs. You're getting tackles for loss and you're getting sacks and you're negating big plays. So even though we are highly aggressive um, and we have a multitude of coverages and pressures and uh, coverages behind said pressures, it is we want to keep people in front of us as well and not give up uh, explosive plays also. Coach, you mentioned the word aggressive a lot. and We've heard that a ton since you've sure. gotten there. First of all, d define that not from a – coaching perspective but yeah. from a player like inside the mind of a player can you coach being aggressive for a player that's either not aggressive or hasn't been used to that or how does that work in still in a, in a team like North Carolina where you've got sure. a ton of talent on yeah, the defensive do. side but they've struggled producing before you got there how, how do you manage that aspect of it. Sure, and, and all these comments are not a compare and contrast of right. what happened before because um, I never want to come off that way. Um, but just the, the the thing I told them the first, you know, meeting we ever had was we've got to change the way we think. We've got to change the way we play the game, and we've got to play aggressive. We've got to play fast. And a lot of that comes from um, I try to create freedom in the guys when they go out there and play and when they go out there and practice. I like to do all the mental work for them and then give them tips and tools so they can cut it loose and play as fast as they can. And when you're playing fast and you're playing free, I think a natural aggression, you know, does come out and a natural physicality comes out when you play this game. Every day that every day that we meet, uh, we always meet as a unit. And I always show a highlight film of red dot, green dot. So if it's a green dotted play and somebody's uh, – video comes up and they have a green dot around them, this is about to be really good. And we're about to hype it up and the guys are going to get excited and they're going to see the standard of execution and the standard of physicality we want to play with in pursuit. 
Well, then if there's a red dot, that's not very good. So the kids already know that it, it's going to be constructive criticism, out of love. Here's what we don't want to do. The actions, whether it's an assignment or in the manner in which we played the play, so that there's just a standard of execution, a standard of pursuit, a standard of tackling, a standard that we finish plays every single play. Um, so I just think it's the upholding, understanding the standard, and then upholding the standard on a daily basis and creating a scheme that is learnable, relatable, so that they can just get out there, they get the call, and they can cut it loose and play as fast as they can. Yeah, Power Echoes, Des Evans both mentioned that sure. um, when we talked to them about being able to play free. And, and, and I want to reiterate what you said before you answered that, is that this is not a compare and contrast Absolutely. to the past. This is for us trying to let folks understand what makes Jeff Collins Jeff Collins, which is sure. why I asked the first question. Now, does the scheme determine physicality? Does approach determine physicality? Or is it strictly within the player themselves? So, so and, 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 what's, and what's your challenge coming in? You, you've had a lot of experience in a lot of different jobs. What's the challenge coming in being a quote-unquote new guy Sure. When you've got guys that have been around for a long time. So one of the biggest things that I wanted to do when I got here for the, the off season and then during spring ball, and now we're getting to work with them this summer too, is I wanted to find what each kid does best, what each young man does best with his skill set. I also threw a lot at them. We played a lot of coverages. We had a ton of blitzes, a ton of fronts. I wanted to see what we could play um, – as a group and individually coach Brown. And I've always been this way throughout my career want to play a lot of guys. Well, with that, as a defensive play caller, I want to know who's in the game for me because there's some players if they're in the game. I'm not going to move a lot. I'm not going to stun a lot. I might not even blitz a lot. Other guys are in the game. I'm stunning. I'm moving. I'm playing a little more man coverage. I'm playing a little more zone coverage with certain guys. So I like to, plan out and script who is in the game so that I can call plays accordingly based on what our guys can do, whether that be an odd front, whether that be a four down even front, whether it be a bare front, it is what our players and specifically each individual player can do to help us uh, play at a high level. And I think that the thing that's enabled me to do that is my wealth of experience that I've gained over the years there's not – like, if you look at my defenses from FIU, they don't look anything like my defenses at Mississippi State. The Mississippi State – I was watching it today making a cut-up, a teach tape for tomorrow. My defenses at Mississippi State don't look anything like the defenses at Florida. And the defenses at Temple were a kind of hybrid between Mississippi State and Florida. This iteration of what we're going to produce at University of North Carolina, I don't know – which version it's going to fit into, um, you know, as we enter the season. And I'm definitely not telling with, you know, Minnesota listening as well. Right. <laughs> Coach, you have an educational background in psychology. Sure. Um, did you, you ever think you would use that component of your education um, so much once you became a football coach? Yeah, that, that's the actually one of the pieces that, that I love the most. Um, my meeting tomorrow with the guys – is going to be a lot about precognitive recognition and living in the moment, those kind of things. So it's um, it's great that I had those foundational uh, backgrounds in psychology. Um, and then I read a million books on it as well. I was talking to Will Hardy yesterday. There's a book by Malcolm Gladwell called Blink. And it is the whole process of knowing something without even having to think about it, thin slicing, those kind of, you know, uh, concepts. And it's nice to be around a bunch of guys that you can kind of have that um, those conversations with while still having an edge and still, you know, talking about flying to the ball and talking about mayhem. You can still get into philosophical, deep conversations with the guys um, and then they can still use that that knowledge and then play with, you know, reckless abandon as well. You mentioned earlier that that offenses now are, are doing a lot more motion. Yep. Um, I know. It used to be just up tempo, and now it's multi tempo. Sure. So you're getting a lot of different looks, but you're also talking about we got to slow it down and make it instinctual for the guys. 
how do you balance that when the offense is throwing so much at you right. to get the guys in position where they're not panicking, trying to figure out every little thing they're seeing? Yeah, and I think a lot of that comes with me and how I can handle the game as well. Um, early in my career, I think two years of my career as a coordinator, I was up in the box. Then the spread, no huddle, things started happening. And I felt my best contribution was being on the field. I can feel the game. I can feel the tempo. I can feel when guys, you know, are stressed, not being able to look at me. Well, I'm not going to give them a long call if somebody is going really, really fast. And so I try to take as many of the checks and adjustments out of their hands and I handle it. And then they just have to know there's um, there's techniques that we build into every single thing that we do. We drill those techniques across all positions every single day. So you've seen this out there. We'll do a blitz circuit. We'll do a turnover circuit. Um, we'll do a DDF circuit, whatever it is. Um, fire zone circuit, whatever. And they just have to know what part of the technique they're being asked to do to execute that part of the defense. So we can do a lot of stuff because guys just need to apply whatever technique it is to the call. And those techniques, I move those around in the defenses that we play. I hope that wasn't too convoluted of an answer, but um, I just try to make it as simple for the guys so they can just cut it loose, execute, do their job, and let's roll. No, that's that's great. And and when you call in plays, are you calling in to the middle linebacker? Are you calling in to each line? Or are you calling in to everybody? So interesting. So I think we're about to see um, a monumental shift again in offensive football. Now using the headsets and the green dots on the you know the the helmet communication. So it'll be interesting how each team uses these new rules. And the microphones are supposed to cut off at 15 seconds. So can you use the microphone? to communicate, the walkie-talkie to communicate. Are you going to have to still signal? We will have all those um, methods in place, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see these first three weeks, you know, how offenses adjust and then how we adjust um, to the newness of all of this. You mentioned DDF. Can you explain that? That's a, that's old George O'Leary saying, deliver, disengage, and finish. So when somebody's coming to block you, You've got to deliver the blow, then you've got to get off the block, and then you've got to finish to the ball carrier or the next, um, you know, person that's trying to block you. And that's one of our circuits. So there's all kinds of different drills that we have uh, that, you know, Ted Monachino teaches a defeated leverage drill. Tommy Thigpen teaches a long, long arm drill. And those are just different ways that we teach at all levels of the defense how we attack blocks, with violence and aggression, get off blocks, and then finish to the ball carrier. So let's back up a little bit. We're talking with Jeff Collins, North Carolina defense coordinator, who's been gracious with his time. Sure. I want to ask you, when you had that time off, you certainly knew about North Carolina. You you, you know, the, the opportunity of a job at North Carolina comes, you watch a lot of tape. When you get on campus, finally, I guess in January, what surprised you the most – about the program, and we've talked about Mac Brown, but about the program, but about the talented players you had on defense. Well, that so I, you know, uh, I was approached about a lot of jobs, um, and I went down the road with a couple of them, but this one um, stood out to me because of Mac Brown, um, family in the area, all those kind of things. But then I started watching all the tape, and there's really good players on this roster. Um, defensively, the front seven. I mean, it's it's. I don't want to over hype it how you know how I feel, but I, I'm really excited about the guys that we have in the front four. Uh, Power Eccles, I think he's one of the uh, best leaders that I've ever been around. A great player, one of the best in the league. And then Amari Campbell, um, you know, he's really good as well. And then on the back end, you've got Elijah Huzzy, you got Marcus Allen, who have played a ton of ball. And then Jakeen Harris comes in, Stick Lane, Will Hardy. We get a healthy Dre Boykins back, uh, two sport, uh, two sport Caleb Cost uh, playing at the star position. Shout out to our baseball team as well. Hats off to them. Um, but it, it's just there. It, it is a talented roster, and uh, you know defensively, and I you know just excited. I think the first meeting you know I had with them, um, thing I learned a long time ago. 
people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So me pouring into those guys and just letting them know how much I care about them, the relationships that I've tried to build um, with each and every one of them uh, over the last six months. Um, you know, I think those kind of things matter. And uh, it's a it's a fun group, a fun group to coach. They got a they got an edge. They've got a chip on their shoulder because um, obviously they read social media, too. And they, you know, they want to uh, they want to change the narrative about how defense is played at the University of North Carolina. And I'm, I'm happy to, to help them. When you come into it and you've got guys that need pushing, but maybe aren't used to being pushed in a certain way, sure. what's that challenge? And, and I'll go ahead and say, most people mention Travis Shaw the most on inside yeah. Carolina and across the board, that this is a guy who's potentially a first round draft pick sure. if, if it'll click. Sure. When you approach – a guy like that or a player like that and, and try, sort of changing the mindset and knowing how to push different guys, different ways, right. just sort of talk to that a little bit. Yeah. I think a hey, Travis is phenomenal, right? Um, very talented. I thought he had 15 really good spring practices, but I think it goes back to relationships, you know, before you can sit there and browbeat a guy and call him out in front of his peers and all those kind of things. And if you don't have a relationship and there's not trust established that you care about the young man and you want what's best for him. You know, so I, I'm not one of those. I try to give as much relentless enthusiasm and positivity uh, poured into each guy. And then at a time when I do need to make a correction, they understand that it's not from a mean spirited place. It's from a place. I know what to make, what to say to make you better. Here are the points that you need to improve on. And hopefully the relationship piece um, you know, helps with that, you know, correction and, the you know, guys getting better and improving and all those kind of things. And it's also, you know, we do the unit meetings every single day and it's just facts that we point out. It's not a, it's not, we have a mean spirit towards anybody. This is really good. We're going to show it to everybody. This is something that we have to correct. We show it to everybody, but it's out of love and respect and, you know, wanting us to have the best product as a whole and for those guys to go and live their dream once they leave this place of playing at the next level. These are the things that will help you do that. And we've tried to do that for the last six months and obviously we'll continue moving forward. You mentioned baseball and Scott Forbes and, and the baseball team. They're, they're player led, but he knows that how he approaches it is what they see as well. How important is player led for this defense, for this North Carolina team? A guy like Cayman Rucker. Yep. Power Echoes, obviously. Yep. Um, but just the leadership aspect and being player led where you don't have to rely on them. They that you all want them to trust you as a coach. Sure. But they trust their buddies too, and right. you got Rucker pulling them forward. And it's 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 such a great group. And it there's um I don't know the exact number, um, but I think it's close to ten that are playing their last year of college football. And you have that across a group of guys that, um, you know, came in Rutgers played 2,500 snaps uh, in the Carolina blue uh, power echoes. I think has played 2,200 or 2,300 in the, that's a lot of ball and they work so hard. They're respected, they're trusted. And, you know, we'll put it on them to, to get them going. And we've got a cool little tradition before every scrimmage. And we'll do it once we start playing too, is the last thing that we do in our last walk through our last meeting is everybody daps up everybody in the room. And the first time we did it, I think it lasted 30 seconds. Um, we did it last Thursday before the coaches hit the road on vacation. That that dap up, hug up session might have lasted five minutes. So the connection, um, believing in each other, respecting each other, you know, those kind of things are, are immeasurable. And, uh, you know, we've got a great group of guys that, you know, is doing that right now. Uh, Coach, Mac Brown has used the, the blue team and the white team in terms yep. of you know, separating guys who are ready to play and maybe those who are not. Yep. You talked about playing a lot of guys. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you were in Georgia Tech, you talked about guys who were above the line yep. uh, be, being able to play. Um, how do you balance having you know maybe 20 guys who are able to play 
when you get into maybe late game situations um, or, you know, it could be goal line situations, how do you kind of say, okay, well, we've got this group ready to play, but then we also need to prepare for these special situations. Yep. So interestingly, so this morning, me and our GA Parks, Parks Cochran, who is a Carolina Tar Heel player, now is a graduate assistant. We watched the Mississippi State 2014 game versus uh, Texas A&M. I think it was a three versus five matchup. And then we watched the Auburn versus Mississippi State game two versus three, a week later, maybe something like that. We were rotating a full second team in throughout the game. Like every third series, we would roll the whole second team in and we played great red zone defense. It was situational once we got into the second half. But early in the game, we were rolling guys in so they would be fresh at the end of the game. They'd be fresh at the end of the season. Um, the Auburn game wasn't as much wholesale, but it was still – there was 24 to 25 guys that played on defense for what eventually ended up being, you know, number one team in the country for a while in 2014. So just that um, philosophy, I'm so glad um, that I shared that commonality with Coach Brown. And when he started talking about the blue team and the white team, I'm like, that's what I've always done. So I'm just – I get it. I love it. Let's, I, I'll just change how I've called it. Now it's the blue team and the white team, and uh, we use that one in the defensive unit meetings. Um, the young guys are trying to establish themselves as solid white team players and eventually you know, move their way up so that they can just be able to contribute um, meaningful snaps uh, in games. And then the, the last one I have for you, um, just wanted to ask about tackling and practice. This has yeah. been a – you know, interesting conversation over the years. Coaches have different opinions. What is your opinion on the importance of, of tackling in practice and if it's necessary to build build the physicality that you want? Well, I, th I think you guys have seen uh, the tackling circuits that we do. That we do. Um, we've got a really comprehensive tackling circuit. I've actually um, – there were two uh, – I don't know what you call them, two dummies or two whatever those things are. Um, that we didn't have in the program, sled, tackling sleds, and there's a new tackling dummy that I've used before. Anyway, that we've ordered that we'll be able to use in the preseason and throughout the season as well. So we simulate every single type of tackle that you can every single week. Then we do a great job of teaching thud, profile tackles, side tackles, all those kind of things to keep everybody safe. But we've already talked about Coach Brown has brought this up um, probably more than anybody, and we'll use uh, the allotted amount of times during practice uh, to go live, um, understand that the health and safety of the guys is, is paramount. Um, but I think the drill work that we do, our focus on getting to a profile tackle, even when we're in thud, not going to the ground, and the physicality and also understanding taking care of your buddy, um, you know, I think those things are, are, are very important. We're wrapping up with Coach Jeff Collins. Coach, I feel like you probably talk ball in your sleep. Um, so I'm going to ask you a fun one before we get out of here. What does Jeff Collins do when he's not talking or thinking about football? Uh, hang out with my wife and daughter, man. I've been, I've been, uh, I've been six months up here without them, and I'm, uh, I'll try not to get emotional, but uh, I will go on the next three weeks of vacation and spend a ton of time with them. And then they're actually moving up here uh, into July, thank goodness. And uh, we'll be back together again. So I'm spending time with my family, riding my Peloton. And uh, I'm a simple dude, man. Who, who's your Peloton trainer? Okay, so I, great question. Uh, Dennis Morton's probably the one I go to the most. Uh, I like Alex Toussaint. Uh, when I want to set a PR, put on a you know really good ride, and I need some, need some bangers going to good music. Um, Ben Aldis, when I'm taking long rides, I don't know if that's too detailed of a answer, but those are, those are probably my top three. No, I think it's awesome. I, I've got a buddy of mine with a Peloton. He's all about some Kindle tool, whatever yeah. the name is. Uh, he says she gets him going. So <laughs> it's been, a, it's, it's been a fun conversation. I do appreciate it. Um, Carolina, Minnesota, what? 60 some days away. Can yeah. you believe it? It's getting here. It's getting here. The. Our defense, our we call it the the lab, um, our defensive staff meeting room. There's Minnesota stuff everywhere, so um, we know the challenge we've got ahead of us, and uh, 
you know, we're going to spend the time uh, getting ready. That is North Carolina defense coordinator Jeff Collins. That's Greg Barnes. We've been sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt and Congruity. Coach, appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Coach.